Good morning. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this morning. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, a, a friend of mine um, called and said, hey, we're, gonna, we're going out to the East Coast. They live in Indiana now. And they said, we're going out to the East Coast. Um, would it be all right if we stopped by and saw you? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and so I said, you guys can stay at our house. and It'll be fun. And he's like, wait a minute. Are you sure? Because he has three boys and a girl. And I have three girls and a boy, so that's eight kids in our house. I was like, yeah, man, we'll just throw the air mattresses on the floor. We'll be great. Um, and so it was, it was, it was great. So uh, we were looking at this weekend and coming up, and uh, I thought about it and thought about it. I was praying about it. And I didn't want to do this to him because my, my friend that came to, to see us is a wonderful guy, a, a fellow pastor that I, was, I grew up kind of in the ministry with. We both grew up here under my predecessor, Pastor Stokes. Um, uh, and actually, I think Pastor and Karen, you're in the room, right? Where are you? There you go. Everybody say hi to Pastor and Karen Stokes. They're happy they're here. Um, but uh, this guy, Joel, and I, we kind of grew up uh, together in the ministry. And uh, I, I knew, I knew when I go on vacation, it, it's very hard to be on vacation and know that you're going to preach on Sunday. Um, because your mind is always on what you're going to say. Your mind is always on the sermon. Like there's always like this big thing looming over you. So it's hard to be on vacation and preach the, the, the following was Sunday. So I, I didn't want to do that to Joel. <laughs> and so I was hesitant to ask him, hesitant to ask him. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to ask him. And so I asked Joel, Joel, you're in town. Do you want to, you know, we have a guest speaker slotted for that Sunday. Do you want to, do you want to take that spot? And I said, I didn't, I didn't want to ask you. I didn't want to do this to you, Joel. And he said, no, it'll be okay because that's actually the start of our vacation. So I can come in and preach. And so I'm really, really excited to have uh, Joel Slater with us today. Joel and I have lived a lot of life together, our families. Um, in fact, we used to live, we both lived in Bentry apartments at the same time. And so this is back before any of us had kids. So Joel and Holly, and then my wife and I, we'd hang out, watch lots of movies together, eat lots of food. Um, and so we were, you know, Joel and Holly were at the hospital when, when our firstborn was born. We were at the hospital when their firstborn was born. And so uh, we just lived a lot of life with them. So I'm, I'm really, really excited and honored. Uh, and he'll share his story, so I'm trying not to steal his material. Um, I'm really excited and, and honored to, to welcome to the, the pulpit to, to preach today, Pastor Joel Slater. So will you join me in, in welcoming him on stage? Yeah. Life was going great until 2009. Uh, you see, I grew up in a place called Adelaide, Australia, small town. You've probably never heard of it. Uh, but I grew up and my parents put me in piano lessons, so I started playing piano. And I started as a teenager exploring uh, singing and all of this combined with like I was learning, learning about the Lord and, and I started to write songs and then I had some opportunities at my church in Australia to lead worship. And so all was going good and I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be great if one day I can play piano in a church setting and earn money doing it. So I did a quick assessment of my church in Australia. I thought, there's no way they'll ever be able to bring me on, you know. And so I set my gaze on the United States of America. I'm like, they got some money over there. Maybe I'll move over there and they'll be able to pay me to play piano. And so in 2003, I packed up everything I owned in two suitcases. I hopped on a plane and I moved to this place called Fairfax, Virginia. I had a buddy here. Uh, who said, hey, you could sleep on my couch and I have a church that you can connect with. And so that was enough for me to get me over there. I had no working visa. I had no plan. I had $1,200. As you know, you can barely go out to eat with $1,200. But that's what I had at the time. And so I came over here and in the first week, um, I had an opportunity to sit down with Pastor Stokes, and uh, I introduced myself to him and said, hey, I'd love to do music in, in the church. And just to kind of fast forward the story, we got to the discussion that I needed a visa. And he said, okay, we can sponsor you. The church can sponsor you as a religious worker. You can be a religious worker. We'll sponsor you. That way you can be here legally and work and earn money. 
And, and, and basically what a religious visa means is that you possess some sort of skill that no one else in the United States of America possesses, and therefore America needs you to stay. Um, so that's what it says on paper. We put down that I would be like the worship leader here at Expectation Church. But in essence, he said, Joel, I really need someone to clean the toilets. So that will be your like real job. But I didn't care because I had a few opportunities. I came back, I played piano, and eventually part time went to full time, which led to me being and able to do what I thought that I was that I was called to do, which was to to play piano and to lead people in worship, which leads me to 2009, where it all went wrong. And that was when God knocked on my heart, said, Joel, I want you to step away from the piano and I want you to preach. I want you to step up to become a pastor. I'm like, God, you, you must have the wrong guy. Like I have trouble speaking. I'm not sure if I can, I can do this. I'm very, very comfortable playing and leading worship and doing all of that stuff. But speaking to people without anything in front of me it's kind of like, that's a, that's a scary thing. Um, it's, but I said to God, I said, you know what? I'll meet you halfway. And God's so good. He's like, okay, I'll meet you there. And I said, I always start doing some Bible classes. I'm like, well, how do, I, how do I do that? And so I saw that everyone else was going to Liberty University. I was like, I guess I'll just go there. And so I started these online classes. And while I was doing that, my desire to step up and to become a pastor, although scary continued to grow. And so, uh, and so this kind of came into this time where Pastor Christian was, was going to plant uh, Exponential Church in Florida. And I mentioned to Pastor Stokes, I said, hey, yo, uh, hey, uh, I would think God is calling me to be a pastor, but I'm not, sh not sure like when this should happen. I'm thinking like maybe we could do like an eight to 10 year plan here that, that I could just keep playing piano and, and maybe one day I will uh, be able to, to, to be a pastor and go through that process. He said, well, Pastor Christian's leaving. How about six months? I was like, well, that's moving a lot quicker than I wanted it to move along. But I sort of jumped on the opportunity. And so Pastor Christian started to kind of walk me through. We'd do like some hospital visits together. And, and uh, so I learned from him. And uh, we, we, we set up a track for me to be ordained. And so what happened with my ordination, that kind of coincided around the same time that we did a trip to California. We went out to San Francisco because my wife had a friend who was getting married out there. And so we hopped the plane in 2013. And we went out there and I started to look around. I was like, where, where are the churches out here, you know? And it just, I was looking around. I'm like, there seems to be like a lot of people that need Jesus. And so I started, well, hang on a second. I'm getting ordained next month. Hey, Holly, I got a great idea. Listen to me. Uh, what would you think if we were to move out here to plant a church in San Francisco. And I don't know what she was thinking because she said, yeah, I would do that. Let's pray about it. Let's see if God is leading and calling us out here. And then, then let's do it if that's the direction that God is leading us. And so that's what we did. And we came back and we presented the vision. We prayed about it. We thought this is what God has uh, called us to do. And I'll just let you know that I'd only preached a handful of times. And so, so, but some reason, some reason we thought, yes, California, San Francisco, that's the place that we, we should, should be. Now, something happened during this period. In fact, seven years ago in June, I stood on the stage and I said some things and they weren't right. And so I'm glad seven years later, I have a chance just to come back and to fix some things that I said that wasn't, wasn't right back then. See, at some point in this journey of me uh, deciding and God calling us to go to, to California, I started to think, wow, you know, there's fewer than 4% Christians there in, in San Francisco. God must, uh, God must be calling me because I'm the best of the best to go on out there to to start a church like I must be someone special maybe one day they'll write my biography up like good thing Joel went to California to start a church and I never like really said this to anyone but that was kind of the attitude of my heart and so uh, as I stood up on seven years ago I said some things that I probably shouldn't have 
In fact, probably more so in conversation with some of you in the hallways, you know, you guys would come to me. So I'm not all at fault here. I'll throw some blame out there on you guys. But you'd come to me and you'd say, hey, Joe, come, come here. And you'd put your arm around me and say, you know, it's uh, expensive out there in San Francisco. That's a lot of money. You know that, right? And I'm like, yeah, well, we've done our research. You know, we know it's going to be a lot of money. And then I responded, and this is where I was wrong. I said, um, I would say something like this. Well, when I go to California, I'm going to start a piano teaching business, which I had done here. And I'm going to do that out there in California. And I'm going to have this many students. And that's going to provide this much money. Therefore, I'll be able to pay, pay that much in rent each month. And you see the error in what I was telling you guys. And so God, who is good, who is gracious, who is kind, who is merciful, graciously provided safe passage for us to get out to California. He provided a home for us. Someone decided to rent their two-bedroom flat to us in a neighborhood called Potrero Hill. Um, to us who had three boys. I was a Christian man. I'm grateful that he allowed us to, uh, to live there. Um, and so we got all our stuff in our little unit here and we set up and I said, okay, first things first. We'd paid a couple of months rent ahead of time, but the third month was coming. I'm like, okay, I got to start this business that I've so boldly told everyone that I'm going to start so I can earn this, uh, this money to pay this rent that's going to be coming on month three. And so uh, we had put our son, Finn, in school. He was in kindergarten there at the local school. And uh, we had this magic email address. We were given to it by the school. It says, hey, if you ever need to reach every parent in the entire school, you can use this email address. I was like, that's my ticket. That's my ticket. If I can just write up this amazing blurb, hey, piano lessons in San Francisco are now here like there's no other piano teacher in the state or in the city. Uh, Joel Slater is here with X amount of experience teaching piano and you would be so blessed if you would allow him to teach your child for a a lump sum of money. And so I said all that in this email. I made up a graphic. I had my wife edit it and put in all the commas in the right place. And I hit send. And do you know what happened when I hit send? How many students did I get? One. Sophia Hernandez signed up for piano lessons. And I started to do the math. Well, if I'm charging, which was a good rate, $40 a lesson, that's a, that's a good amount of money. But when my rent was at $4,500, and even though we had amazing support, I'm like, we, we're not going to make it here with just Sophia. Like, this isn't gonna, gonna work. And so what happened after that? I realized that I had been in error. In fact, what I did was I took my Bible that next morning and I went to the backyard and I opened it up and I started to read my Bible and I knew in Matthew 6 that there were some important words that Jesus gave and so I started reading those that said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you as well. And I read in 1 Peter chapter 5 that we are to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand and at the right time he will lift us up and I asked God for forgiveness that I was so prideful to think that I could even take my next breath without him allowing me to do so. And I took a month. I cried every morning, God, how are we going to make it here in this place if you are not in it? And I humbled myself before God. And so it got to a month. I'm like, well, we still have this financial situation, this need that we need to earn money. And so I said to Holly, I said, what should we do? How can I somehow gain students here in this place? She said, well, why don't you just send that, send that same email out and, uh, to the same magic email address and just see what happens. And so that is what I did. I took the email address. I maybe edited it down a little bit. And I sent it out. It was 8 p.m. on a Wednesday night. I was getting ready for bed. And all of a sudden, I got a response from a parent 
Karen reached out and she said, hey, I would like to put my daughter Ava in piano lessons. And so I was like, oh, oh this, is, this is different from before, you know. So I started responding, well, I have 3.30 on Wednesday. Would that work for you? And while I was writing that response, another email came in and another and another and another and I was just, I, I recognized this is, has to be God because when I tried to do it before on my own strength in my own way, it led to nothing. But when I surrendered this situation to God, God all of a sudden showed me that when I humbled myself before him, that is what activates him. That's what allows him and his power to, to, go, to, to go to work. And so... So we were there in, in California, and here we are seven years later, and I just want to tell you guys the one thing, I'm going to just say the most important thing that, that I've learned in seven years since I was, I was up here last time, and I want to share it with you today. And the, it's just, just one simple word. It's the word humility. The word humility, if I could tell you this one thing. Now, you don't have to... You don't have to uh, be a church planner to understand humil humility. In fact, I'm going to just go out on a limb here and say, uh, seeing that we are at church, and I know some of your stories here, that there are many people in this room who understand humility, meaning that you've taken a, t a time, there's been a moment in history where you've thought, or you've come to, to this place, to use uh, Luke 15, the prodigal son, but when he came to his senses, that you've had a when you came to your senses moment, right, where you have said, God, I can't do this on my own. I can't save myself from my own sin. Therefore, I am going to humble myself before you, and I'm going to receive your free gift that you have freely offered me, which is faith, faith in Jesus and in what he did for me on the cross. And I'm going to believe that, and I ask you to be the Lord of my life. You've had a humbling experience. And I want to say humility is important. In fact, it's a requirement for salvation. You would agree. It's a requirement for salvation. We must humble ourselves before God. But I want to go the next step here and say that humility is also a requirement for service. If we want God to, uh, to be usable, moldable, shapeable in any way and used by God for his purposes, we need to also be humble. We need to learn to humble ourselves before God. Now, I know there's people here who uh, you probably wouldn't ever say it because you're actually humble. And so you would, but you, you, you understand that, hey, I got to humble my heart before the Lord and I need to serve him. And that's what, what you are doing. And you're doing that faithfully. So you might kind of understand that better than I did uh, seven, seven years ago. And then there might be people like myself who are like, okay, well, here's San Francisco. And that needs, they need Jesus out there. And, and I believe, God, you've called me to do this. But God, you do your thing over there because I think I possess the qualities and the qualifications needed for me to go do something significant out here. And I might even give you a shout out every now and again. God. And God can allow us, we can either humble ourselves voluntarily or God can allow us to get to the end of our rope where we, where we have to, he leads us to a point where we have no choice but to humble ourselves. And that was the point that God allowed me to get to. And, and so as we talk about this word humility, to be humble, we got to acknowledge that it's not really a, a sexy word, right? It's not something we walk around with a t-shirt that says humility on it, right? It's not really like a buzz word, right? In fact, the world doesn't really value that. They may view being humble as a sign of weakness, right? So if you're applying for a job, you may say, well, I've possess this quality and I'm strong and I'm bold and I have really great communication skills. We have to kind of puff ourselves up to kind of look good to the world. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, first of all, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, 16, it says that we are to be holy because he, our Father in heaven, is holy. God calls us to be holy. So how do we become holy? Well, we look at the, the life of Jesus and we do what Jesus did. And so if we read in the book of Philippians chapter 2, it says that we, 
must have the same mindset as Christ. It says that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We must have the same mindset as, 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 as Christ Jesus, who didn't consider equality with God. That's something that we have to understand. Rather, he humbled himself, became a servant, took on flesh, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself. So if we are to be like Jesus, then we too need to live a life of humility. We too need to live a life of humility. The world would say, uh, the, the world would say humility is taking a, a modest estimate of yourself, taking a modest estimate. But I would say, biblically speaking, that the definition would be a godly humility is not looking down on oneself, but rather looking up at who God is. It's kind of like not thinking, well, I'm just worthless over here. I can't do anything. No, it's focusing our attention on, on God and looking up to him uh, as, as the one enthroned on high that we're not even thinking about ourselves. We've got to look up at who God is. We've got to take ourselves out of the picture. And so I've alluded to this verse, but let's throw it on the screen. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6, that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand, the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift us up in honor. Before we can do anything for God of any significance, we must humble ourselves before him. That was my story before I could preach a message where people would say, hey, that makes sense. Before I could teach a piano lesson, before I could even draw a breath there in California, I had, God had to teach me all about my insufficiency so I would be led to a place where I would depend on his all sufficiency. You know, God leading people to this point in the Bible is a common theme, and I'm very grateful that I'm not unique in this way, that we all struggle with this this pride thing in fact I was reading about this this preacher uh, in the Bible his name is Isaiah right and God had to do some work on his heart before he was ready to go and do something significant for God you see it was in Isaiah chapter 6 where where it was he was it was the year that King Uzziah died and he Isaiah finds himself there in the throne room of God and there's God he's sitting on the throne do you know even here and now today, God is still on the throne. God was on the throne. He is on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Try to picture what this must have been like, right? And then there are these angels called seraphim. And they, they don't have two wings. They don't have four wings. In fact, they have six wings. With two wings, they fly. Two wings, they cover their feet. And the other two wings, they cover their eyes, and they can't stay silent because they're in the presence of God Almighty. So they're declaring, holy, holy, holy. See, one holy wasn't enough, two wasn't enough, and three just kind of scrapes the surface just to sort of ascribe the greatness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And as they're praising God, the whole room, the throne room is shaking. And there is, it is filled with, filled with smoke. What would you do there in that situation when you were seeing God sitting enthroned up there? Well, you'd probably do what Isaiah did. He said, I'm doomed. I'm a goner. I'm done. I am finished because I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among people who have filthy lips. Yet I have seen the Lord, the Lord of the heavens army. I have seen God. And I think there's some things that we can learn from his story. If, I, I'm going to gonna say here once again, it's, it's probably not a, a far stretch to say that if you are a believer of, of Jesus here today, that you want to be used by God and in, in his service. And I think that we could use this story of Isaiah just to learn a few things to help us in our journey because God used him so let's learn from him. The first thing that happened to him is that is he saw the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, he said, In that year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. We too need to see the Lord before we can be used to do anything 
for him or be used by God, right? We think of uh, Moses, right? He had to have that moment. He had that moment where uh, God had a big plan for his life, but he had to see the Lord there in that burning bush. In Luke chapter 9, there is, there is a Peter, James, and John, and they're on this mountain, right? The mount, mountain of trans, transfiguration, right? And Jesus peeled back his humanity, and they saw his deity. They saw the Lord. How about Saul when he's on the road to Damascus and he sees the Lord? And Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We need to see the Lord. We need to see. We need to see God if we are going to be used by him. Not only did he see the Lord, but he also saw himself. He saw himself. This is where he said, I'm ruined, I'm done. Woe is me, I am doomed. For I am a sinful man, I have filthy lips, and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. The truth is, the clearer we see God, the clearer we're going to see ourselves. The clearer we see God, the clearer we will see ourselves for who we truly are. I want to tell you, it's, a, it's easy for us to compare ourselves to someone who is worse than us. Well, at least I'm not Hitler, right? I haven't ever killed anyone, so I'm looking pretty good right now, right? But when we compare ourselves to God, our response is, wow, I'm doomed. I'm a goner because I am a sinful, sinful person. We need to see God. We need to see the Lord, and then we need to see ourselves but God in his mercy he forgives us of our sin he didn't have to do that but he freely does it you see it goes on to say that one of these angels the seraphim flew over with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs and he touched my lips with it and he said see this coal has touched your lips now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven it says what happened? He saw God. He saw himself. He cried out to God, and God forgave him of his sin. And as if that wasn't enough, guess what? God had a purpose and a plan for him. So God cries out. God, God says this, whom shall I send as my messenger to this people who will go for us? God has a plan for Isaiah, and Isaiah responds, here I am. Send me. Isaiah had humbled himself before God Almighty, and now he's ready to be used by God. You might say, there's no way God could ever use me. I'm not talented. I'm not this. I'm not educated. Whatever you may say, fill in the blank. I just want to say that God has a plan and a purpose for your, for your life. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has planned in advance for us to do. God has a plan and a purpose for each person here in this room. We need to see God, see ourselves, cry out to him, God, forgive me like I did at that table and do every day. God, here I am. I'm just messed up. I have nothing. I bring nothing to the table here, God. It is all about you and we could put this in a quippy little saying here that you can write down or get tattooed on your skin later humility leads to mobility if we want to be used by God we must humble ourselves before him humility leads us to mobility so what does God require of us you know the world says well you got to you got to be talented. You got to be able to communicate well. You got to have so many friends on Facebook and a nice clean Instagram feed, whatever that means. And you got to have all of these things. That's what the world requires of us to be someone of importance. But do you know what God says? He says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Hey, you just have to do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. If you want to know what God wants from you here today, do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. 
And that is the most important thing I think I've learned in the last seven years. I bring zero to the table. And everything above and beyond that is all God. The truth is, I was never really qualified to go to San Francisco. I was very much aware of my insufficiency. But it was when God led me to that place that I was aware of his sufficiency. And that's when things started to come. I'd love to stand up here today and say, wow, there's still a church in California that we planted, that we started, and we passed on to someone else. But that, that is not, not the case. But I did want to take a moment just to, just to share our, from myself, my wife, my family, just our gratitude to everything that expectation uh, did for us in supporting us. Many of you guys came to, to visit us. I remember uh, Joel Waterfield came in to town. He was the first visitor we had. We just had moved there, and he took me out and bought me Japanese. I remember that. And I just remember being there and crying like with him because I was seeing someone that, that believed the same things as me and who, 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 would, who would come out and expressed interest in meeting up with me. It was so good the way that you guys supported us. So we started January 2016 in our two-bedroom unit in our living room. We would have to move all our living room furniture into our bedroom. We had this one junk room, and we'd shove the stuff in there and shut the door real quick before it would all fall out. But we'd set up the chairs and the TV, and, uh, and, and we started to grow there. We started our church, and people started to... To, to come to our church, and then we're like, well, we need a new space where outside our home, and so we started to look at a conference room down in Mission Bay on the eastern side of, of San Francisco. We looked at this conference room. I dialogued with management, and then it came time for us to go down and to, uh, to, to rent this place. So I went down and said, hey, we're ready to rent this room with, uh, for, for our church, and the lady behind the desk kind of like, oh, I wish you hadn't have said that you wanted to rent this for your church because management is, is going to have a serious problem with that. I said, well, let me, I'm already ahead of you on this because I've already been speaking to management and they said that, that everything is cool for us to do that. She said, well, who did you speak to? I said, well, I spoke to this person over here. She said, no, that's a different, that's a different building, so that doesn't work for our management here. There's too many managements. I was thinking to myself, and I didn't know what to say next, but I was remembering that the Bible said that God will tell you, give you what to say in that moment. I was like, God, help me. What do I say here? Because we've we got a lot writing on this. We have moved our family out here. We've got other families who have moved out here, and we're going out of our house. What do we do? And I looked over her shoulder, and there was this plaque on the wall, and I said, Monique, I just need to tell you right now that I feel, I said it, I feel discriminated against because you want not renting this place to me because I believe in Jesus. And it says here on the, this wall here over your right shoulder, it says that you do not discriminate based on gender, race, religion, so on, so forth. She said, wait, did you say, you, you, you said you feel discriminated against. I said, yes, that's right. She said, well, I have to report that. I have to file a, a report to my, to my management, or who, whichever management that was. They didn't seem to know. But anyway, so she had to report that. We got a call that afternoon saying that we would be allowed to rent that space. And so we did that for a while. Yes, thank you for clapping. God is good. Yes. So we rented that space for a while, and eventually they found a loophole to get us out. But I will tell you, we were wonderful, wonderful uh, tenants. We came in, and we cleaned up the beer bottles from Saturday night, and we left that place spotless on Sunday mornings, yet they found a reason to remove us. But we just went to the, to the next space. We rented 290 Channel Street, which was this glass building in the middle of the park, so you could see it from the highway. Everyone knew this building. And so we started renting that on Sunday mornings, and... And, and our ch church started to grow in 2018. I remember taking photos as we were doing Operation Christmas Child. And uh, there was like 40 people there. I'm like, this church planning thing is really happening right now. And uh, so we're doing this. And, and, and we got 40 people coming. And I was like, this is amazing. But 
Fast forward to that summer, 2019, it seemed like one family came to us, the Friesens, who were like there every Sunday, and they said, hey, Joel, we just, I just lost my job. We can't afford to stay here anymore, so we have to leave. So they left our church. I was like, dang, that, that's really crap. You know, I didn't like that at all. Can I say that? Thank you. Uh, and so I said, that, that's really bad. I, I'm not happy that that happened, but that's okay. We still got this, this many people. And then, you know, Alex graduated from college, and then Christina moved to Germany. And over the course of a summer, like, everyone left. I'm like, where is everybody gone and going it's like my team and yet we're faithful and then we were removed from that building once again they didn't want us there and so we went to yet another another building and then as you know 2020 came and, and we hung on as long as we we could what we reasoned was we were the only Christians that many people many friends that we had made actually knew so we were very motivated to to be there and we I said to God as things were kind of not looking so great. I said, God, you're going to have to make this very clear if you want us to leave this place because we just knew once we left San Francisco that we weren't coming back. And so, so we, we stayed there and said, God, make it very clear that we should leave. And so 2020 came and so did COVID-19. I was like, I think God, Holly, I said to her, I said, I think God is answering my prayer, at least making it clear that we need to leave here because we can't meet, we can't leave our house, we can't do anything, and we're spending all this money just to be here. I think God is telling us to leave. So in part way, I wanted to take a moment to apologize for COVID-19 because I feel like God was answering my prayer. So i <laughs> uh, sorry about that. And so and so we, uh, we moved in. We now live... In uh, Indiana, we looked at a map and said, where should we go now? I don't, I, I don't know. We looked at a map and we thought, well, our uh, family lives in Valparaiso, Indiana, outside Chicago. I said, well, let's, let's go there. You know, let's, let's move there. And so that's what we, that's what we did. We moved out, out there. And you know what happens in Indiana? Nothing. Nothing happens there and we love it. It's such a wonderful place for us to bring our, our, our kids, and just to circle back to that piano thing, we left San Francisco, everything went virtual, and uh, I continue to teach piano, the students that God opened up way back when, in 2015, I still teach on my phone each and every week, so God has just continued to provide for us, and once again, I just wanted to say thank you for all you guys have done and did for us to be out there. A lot of good happened, praise the Lord, out there. And I'll just tell you, I could tell you a million stories, but I'll just tell you one. Before 2020, in the back half of 2019, uh, one of my things that I would do was we would, we, would, we would set up our space, right? We're a mobile church, so we'd set up our space. And just to kind of clear my head, I would go and get the coffee from Starbucks. We'd get those two, two travelers, right, They're full of coffee. And, uh, and so one day I'm getting the coffee, and I'm looking out the Starbucks window, and I see a family out there, a group of people, and they're circled around, and they're clearly upset. They're crying. And I look, look at them, and I look across the street, and there's this place where we had volunteered as a church, this place called Family House, where people who have a sick child, uh, where they could go stay there for free uh, while their, their, their child was in the hospital just up the street from where we were. And so I did this math and like, they must have a sick child and they must be, uh, have just received some very bad news. They're outside crying. And so I, I was like, well, I'm, I feel really bad for them. And so I, I walked out with the coffee. In fact, Holly had driven me that day. I put the coffee in, in the car. And then this thought crossed my mind that, hey, Joel, you need to go pray with those people. I'm like, was that you, God? Or did I just think that, right? And, and, I was, and it was persistent. Joel, go pray with them. Go pray with them. I said, Holly, I, I think God is telling me to go pray with this, these people here. And I know I don't want to go pray with them. They might cuss me out. They might say, who are you? I might just, might be a real awkward situation. She said, well, if God is telling you to do it, you better go do it. And I was like, oh, what did you do? Okay, fine, I'll do it. Okay. And so I walk over and they're about to disperse. And I said, hey, hey, my name's Joel. And I just saw that you were out here and that you were upset. 
and uh, and I just I'm a pastor of church just over a block or two this way, and I just just wanted to ask if you wanted me to pray with you today. And there, no one had, apparently had asked them that question this particular day at this point, and so they were kind of a little shocked. But they kind of look at each other and they all start nodding their heads. And so I took that moment just to say, "Hey, and you you don't have to tell me anything." that you are going through right now because we serve a God in heaven and he knows everything. So we can just pray and he knows. And a lady spoke up who seemed to be the grandmother of the group and she said, just pray for baby Emma. I said, okay. And so there on the corner of 3rd Street and Mission Bay Boulevard North, as buses whizzed past, as people were walking, we linked arms together and put our arms on each other's shoulders and I prayed for them. I prayed for baby Emma, for her healing, for strength for the family. And in any situation like that, I always like to pray the gospel because people rarely interrupt the prayer. So you can just say whatever you want. So I pray, I like, Jesus, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sin, that when we call on the name of the Lord, that we can be saved. And so I prayed for them in the name of Jesus. Amen. And they look up, we look up and they're crying. I'm holding back tears. I'm like, what just happened here? I was setting up church, but we just somehow, God had, had a different plan for, for, for us here today that we'd be in the right place at the right time and that God was going to use us in this particular way. And so we parted ways that particular day. Well, fast forward a couple of months. I think we were now into 2020 in January while we were still able to meet. And I went to get the coffee again. This time I was on foot. And I see these, uh, this elderly couple with suitcases. And they're out the front of that place, family house. One, one more time. And just to be super weird and awkward, I said, oh, are you checking in or checking out? And they said, oh, we are, we're, we're checking out. We're moving to Philadelphia. Our, our granddaughter, Emma, she's just been accepted into this program out there. And she's, uh, she's going to receive some special treatment that's going to help her with her diagnosis. And I said, and I started thinking, wait, I think I recognize this couple. But before I had a chance to say anything, they said, now, are you a pastor of a church around here? I said, yes. Yes, I am. She said, well, I just, I just need to tell you something. She said, you know, that, that day you prayed with us out front of Starbucks across the street. I said, yeah, that, that was me. She said, well, my son-in-law who is baby Emma's dad, she, he, she said that he had, uh, he had prayed that day that God would send someone to minister to him. In fact, his words were, God, send me an angel today. And she said, at that moment, you came up and you prayed with us. And there's this feeling of that you do these things for God and you don't always understand why God has you at a particular place at a particular time for a particular purpose. But what a humbling experience to be used by God in such a way like, who am I? I'm a flawed sinner. But God orchestrated this moment. And sure as heck, I, had my, I was hugging this lady and in tears just at the thought that God could use Someone like me. And guess what? God can use someone like you because we are all sinners. We are all far from God in desperate need of his salvation. That's where we are this morning. And I'll tell you what God requires of us to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. We thank you just for these few moments to open your word. Thank you for your word that you have given to instruct us here on earth, God. We thank you that you call us and you use us for your purposes, God. God, you didn't need to do that, God. But yet you still choose to use us. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sin. And Lord, I just want to pray that we would walk out of this place, myself included, God, that we would just recognize who you are first and foremost, and in light of that, recognize who we are, that we are insufficient, but you are all sufficient, and that we would lean into you, God. 
Thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each person here today, that we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which you have planned for us to do. May we walk humbly with you, God. And I pray if there is someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray to you, God, that they would call on the name of Jesus today. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, you say in your word, they will be saved. We thank you that you are faithful to us, that you are good, that you are merciful. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.